And we're back. I again with episode 68, isn't it? Of the Horror Guys. Yeah. I'm we're, Kevin. I'm Brian. And we got movies. Lots of movies. Lots of movies. And a short. Four movies. Yeah. And a short. Okay. Yeah. All so, right. we should talk about them, eh? Yeah. Yeah. What did we see? What Will you we tell see? us what we saw? We saw The Island of Doomed Men, which was 1940, Jim, I think. Uh-huh. Uh, Plague of the Zombies. Gotta have a plague. Just, you may as well have just, zombies. Not just one zombie, but a plague. It's way more yeah. fun than the other kind. Mm-hmm. The Amityville Murders, which is kind of an origin story of the Amityville horror, kind of a prequel to the Amityville horror that everybody knows and loves. The the famous one. Yeah, well, everybody knows it. Yeah. yeah, and a horror movie called Population Four Thirty Six, which I talked Brian into seeing because I had seen before and liked it a lot. And I had not seen it. So now we've both seen it. Now we're going to talk about Whether it. Whether I liked it or not, you have to tune in to find out. And a short called The Glass Cabin. Yeah, people mm-hmm. in glass houses, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. shouldn't live it in applies, glass houses. It applies for glass cabins, too. Yeah. It does, yeah. So here we go. All right, and we're going to start out with our old Universal Classic, The Island of Doomed Men from 1940. Color hadn't been invented yet. No. Peter Lorre was still a big hit. Exciting writing hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, well, it was fine. <laughs> but... Well, and the problem was it wasn't a horror movie no, either. it really wasn't. You know, they touted it as you know, part of their shock theater Pro, their shock theater line of movies. and Well, Peter Laurie did lots of horror. So, you know, if he's in one, it's got to be horror, right? Just like if Karloff's in a movie, it's got to be horror. Mm, yeah. Not everything. Still, it's not bad. There, it's, pe- it's not bad. They shoot no. a monkey, so it's all right. Really. <laughs> we don't actually see the, we don't actually see the you know, monkey exploding in blood and guts or anything. It would have been interesting if we had mm, yeah, special effects in 1940. 1940. Yeah. Beware the exploding monkey. Mm. Well, this one's directed by Charles Barton, written by Robert Hardy Andrews, and stars Peter Lorre, Rochelle Hudson, and Robert Wilcox. Only an hour and eight minutes, so you don't have too much to lose on this one. It seemed longer. All these old Universal <laughs> ones are really short, and they always seem a little longer. A lot happens they, in a short amount of they time. They cram it in. They do, <laughs> yeah. It doesn't really drag. There was no boring parts to this. It just like wasn't really. really that was only an hour and eight minutes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what happens? In Did you movie? like it? I liked Peter Laurie's performance. I always do. Everybody else was just sort of there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they were. They were just. Supporting members for pretty for, for a, a well, Peter, he walked around a and Peter scene, right? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so Mark Sheldon reports for duty at the Department of Justice. The boss asks if Mark knows what he's getting into. He'll be doing some kind of undercover work, and the boss says he'll deny ever having met Mark. Mark is henceforth known as Agent Sixty Four. Top secret top things. Secret. Top secret things going on. Of course, if it was me, I'd have wanted to be 007, but he settled for 64. Mm-hmm. All right. 007 is already taken. No. Maybe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, he meets his partner, Agent 46, 64, <laughs> and his partner, 46. I see what they did there. <laughs> well, 46 <laughs> explains it's a secret island owned by a man named Danell, who is a slave trader. As 46 explains all this, he's shot in the back by someone outside. Just coincidentally, we see Danell out in the hallway right afterwards. We don't know he's Danell at that point. Yeah, we don't it's know. Peter Laurie lurking about. That's not Danell, that's Peter Laurie. <laughs> yeah. Being all Peter Laurie ish. Yes. <laughs> Agent 64 is then arrested for the murder because he's the only one there and he does try to run off. But he explains the story so far. Nobody believes him, he's convicted, and sentenced to prison from 1 to 20 years. Seems like a light sentence for murder if you only got one year. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, before long, he's in prison and doing hard labor. Apparently, he serves out the entire sentence with no contact with the Department of Justice. And I suspect this is not how being undercover really works. You don't actually go to prison and serve out years of a sentence to make it look like you're a prisoner. Well, it wasn't years, really. We don't really know how long it was. It was like two days. He got parole. That's why he got out later. He (laughs) was paroled. Late sentence. Had to be at least one year. (laughs) 
Well, mm. it turns out Mr. Danell owns the, the diamond mine on the secret island. He orders the whipping of a prisoner and then goes home to his wife in a nice house surrounded by an electric fence. He just a just guy that wants nice things. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, everyone is terrified of Danell. He knows his wife would leave him if he ever took her to the mainland, so he keeps her on the island like a prisoner in a gilded cage. It's kind of a nice house to be on this weird tropical island. Slave labor build up. Mm. Danell uses parolees as labor on the island, mm -hmm. and he has Mr. Smith, a.k.a. Agent 64, in his sights. Danell gets Smith paroled and onto his plane for a job on the island. The new prisoners sit down to a fancy dinner until another prisoner runs up and warns the newcomers. The guards shoot the prisoner and then march all the newcomers off to work in the mines. I mean, and dinner was going so well until that guy ran up. What was the point of the dinner? He got him on the island. They were in his power at that point. They're all going to be slave labor prisoners. Why give him a fancy de dress-up dinner to begin with? Because he wanted dinner company. and He's a classy guy. Classy right. guy, yeah. It turns out Daniel knows who the murdered Agent 46 was, and he knows that Smith was involved with him. Danell wants to know what was going on and who's on to him. The government. Yeah, he knows 64 is a government agent. Another prisoner tells Smith that he can only leave the island one way, and he'd do well just to get it over with and be killed. You're leaving in a box, one yep. way or the other. Yep. Well, Lorraine Danell, the wife, wants to talk to Smith after she learns he's really an agent. Danell shoots his servant Ziggy's pet monkey to show us how badass he is. Stupid or, monkey! You're kind of crazy. He doesn't like that monkey. You're but kind of crazy, too. Though. A little bit. Yeah. Well, Smith convinces Captain Court, the head guard, that he's only here to steal Danell's diamonds from his safe, and he wants his help. Mm -hmm. Money, money. Mm -hmm. Danell catches Smith and Lorraine together, and then demotes Court. I expected him to kill Court, but mm. he didn't. No. No. Well, Easy, honey. shortly after all the prisoners rebel and break into Denell's housing compound through the electric, electric fence. Why they didn't do this years ago, we don't really know. They needed a leader. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Denell gets the drop on Smith and Lorraine a second time later that night, but Denell starts monologuing, and then Ziggy comes in and stabs him in the back. Shouldn't have killed his monkey. That's right. Denell then shoots Ziggy and then falls over dead. Ziggy, of course, doesn't mind because he's lost his monkey already. Mm -hmm. We then see Smith and Lorraine flying away from Dead Man's Island on a plane. And I just kind of got to wonder if anyone from the Department of Justice is going to remember who he is when he gets back there. Who? Yeah, who are you? Who are you again? Okay, yeah. well, Peter Lorre had done dozens of films before this one, so he really had his cold, creepy factor all worked out by this point. Mm -hmm. He'd already done like 11 Mr. Moto films. And I was wondering through about the first <laughs> half of this film, was he doing more yellow face? No. He, he's no. got those eyes, and he just sort of looks like he's trying to be Asian. That's just how he was. <laughs> I guess so, yeah. <laughs> was, well, it worked as Mr. Moto. As this guy... Oh, oh, I thought it really worked well on this. Okay. I thought it was perfect for this. Yeah. He's a strange one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, people are always lighting his cigarettes with shaky hands, so it's obvious that they're terrified of him. Although we don't actually see him do much... Their fear speaks volumes. Mm -hmm. Would have been nice to have seen him actually torture someone or kill someone or something like that, but the 1940 censors wouldn't go for it. There was a little bit of whipping. They had to tone it down for the censors, though. I think you could see no. the guy get whipped one time, mm -hmm. and then after that it's just him screaming more, mostly off screen. I, for it's the trivia, this sounds like there was more filmed, but they had to cut it back. Yeah, because of the censors. 1940. Yeah. yeah. It's entertaining, has a few surprises, but there's nothing here that even remotely approaches horror in the modern definition. Men being kept prisoner by a sadist on an island is mm. a good dramatic plot, mm -hmm. but horror, yeah, no. really. No, not really. They did kill a monkey, so there's that, but that monkey had it coming. Mm -mm. No, no, he didn't. Poor monkey. Poor monkey. Yeah. But if you're a Peter Lorre fan, or if you hate they, monkeys. Or if you hate monkeys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is a good one to watch. <clears throat> one animal is harmed in the creation of this film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What else did we see? Oh yeah, Plague of the Plague of the Zombies. Plague of the Zombies from Hammer. 1966. Classic Hammer. 
And it was color. Hammer and color. Finally. Finally, color. So what did you think of Plague of the Zombies? It was okay. It was all right. It was yeah. a little different for a zombie film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Was it, it the... It was full of hammer tropes from the 60s. Hammer yeah. tropes, hammer mm-hmm. characters. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful, beautiful sets and beautiful costumes and... Yeah. Yeah. Directed by John Gilling, written by Peter Bryan, stars Andre Morel, who was Watson in Hound of the Baskervilles, oh. and we've seen him in some other things too. Yeah, recognize Diane Claire stuff. and Brooke Williams, Hour and 30 Minutes. Link to pick it up in the show notes as usual. Kind of neat looking cover on the DVD box. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, we begin in the midst of some kind of ritual. A priest wears someone else's face like a mask. I well, think it was supposed to be somebody's face. It, it, well, I think it was a clay mask. Yeah. You could see it later more clearly that it was a clay mask. But initially, yeah, it looked like he was doing a leather face. <laughs> <laughs> and then he pours blood on a small voodoo doll as natives play their drums. Boom, 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 boom. boom. So it's kind of a mashup of vaguely African, vaguely Haitian, vaguely, you know. It, it's kind of a mashup of... British, it's hammer. It's British. British, British white idea people in the '60s. British is British white people's idea of what these. What do you imagine were. Haiti is like? Well, they got lots of Africans. There. Yeah, yeah, brown skin people. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly dressed like African tribal people. Yeah, and and a funny point of this too, they're they're clearly men. You know the drummers. Yeah, he hides them somewhere, I guess, when he's not using them for drumming. He just brings out the drummers when he needs to do a ritual. <laughs> They're in this village, and yeah, he, he keeps them stashed in the closet or something. They're not villagers, <laughs> that's for sure. You never see, you know, maybe he's got cells that he locks them away in when they're not drumming or what. But you never see other than when they're drumming during the ceremonies. The captive drummers. <laughs> They look like they're into it. Yeah, you know, they're yeah, good. They're I mean, they they were real drummers. They were really doing it, and <laughs> and they, they were good at it. <laughs> well, the credits roll as the ritual continues. A woman somewhere else wakes up screaming. Mm. The next morning, Sir James Forbes talks to his daughter Sylvia. He gets a letter in the mail from Doctor Thompson, claiming that his village is being besieged by a strange malady. The people of the village are dying for just no particular reason. We know the reason. Forbes and Sylvia yeah. pack their bags to go and help investigate. He's like the Surgeon General or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. An expert. In Seemed kind of ditzy in the first few scenes. No, no. He's just he's just um, a, a curmudgeon. And, yeah. Eccentric. An eccentric curmudgeon. I want to be an eccentric but he's brilliant. curmudgeon. But he's brilliant. I want to be yeah. a brilliant eccentric he's, curmudgeon. He's Sherlock Holmes level brilliant. No, he's you know, yeah, smart much. guy, but me- very medical focused. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Dr. Watson a few years later. Yeah, maybe. So Dr. Thompson's wife, Alice, doesn't seem particularly happy to see them when they arrive. And it turns out she's the girl we saw screaming earlier, and she has a serious looking cut on her wrist, mm-hmm. which she won't allow anyone to look at. The latest victim's brother, who also appears to be the town drunk, accuses Dr. Thompson of causing the deaths, since there have been 12 deaths... And Thompson's been in twelve in town for twelve months. Mm. The villager is complete. Yeah. No, not coincidence. It is kinda. That was. Yeah. He, he had nothing to he do really with it. He really didn't. Yeah. Yeah. The villagers completely refused to allow Thompson to do an autopsy, and the local leader, Squire Hamilton, won't allow anything of the sort. So Forbes suggests going out and digging up one of the victims that night at midnight. Turns out the body is gone. The coffin is empty. Yeah, the police show up and are going to bust them for grave robbing. And um, what? Body, body, body snatching. snatching. What yeah. body? Body? No. <laughs> There's no body. And then so then the police are like, um, yeah, something's not right here. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Alice sneaks out and Sylvia follows her. Sylvia gets grabbed and abused by a group of five of the squire's men. Looks like it's going to be bad for yeah, Sylvia. Yeah, and then they 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 have an incident earlier, early in the movie too. Yeah, yeah these, these five are these trouble guys are dicks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they are. And just no other way to put it. Yeah. Terrorizing the village. Mm-hmm. Well, the squire intervenes, rescuing Sylvia from them. He releases her, but warns her not to fall into one of the abandoned tin mines that litter the estate. Hmm. And after Sylvia leaves, it's made clear that Hamilton has planned the whole encounter, including the rescue. Mm-hmm. 
He put those guys up to it. Yeah. On her walk home, Sylvia spots a zombie carrying Alice's dead body. Thompson and Forbes do an autopsy on Alice and look at the wound on her arm. They do some tests and figure out that she's been splashed with some kind of non-human blood. Hmm. How did she die? Hmm. How indeed. Hmm. Well, the town drunk says he saw his recently deceased brother roaming around near the tin mine where they found Alice. As a zombie? Hmm. Maybe. Hmm. Hmm. They go to visit the tin mine, which was closed down a few years ago when too many workers died in accidents. Hmm. Squire Hamilton comes to visit Sylvia. While they talk, Sylvia gets cut on a broken glass. Hamilton sneaks out with a sample of her blood. He then goes home and opens his drawer full of voodoo dolls. And you realize that's what happened with Alice. That's how she got the cut on her hand. Yeah. He, he did that, made it look like an accident, and snuck away a sample of her blood. Quite a large sample of blood, the way he pours it out. Mm-hmm. Well, Forbes asks the local vicar if he has any books on black magic, and the vicar shows him everything he's got. Hmm. I can't imagine going to any of the local priests around here asking, Hey, you got any hey, black you magic any books black that I can magic read? Books? Anything on zombies and voodoo? Oh, sure we do. Yeah, yeah I'm sure the whole collection <laughs> yeah. in the back. Yeah. <laughs> Forbes figures out that voodoo is at work. Forbes, Thompson, and the vicar go to the cemetery to watch the grave. Well, the vicar is attacked by Hamilton's men in masks. Dead Alice gets up and goes after Thompson and Forbes, and Forbes cuts her head off with a shovel. Another scene they had to tone down for the censors a bit. Yeah, he kept hitting her with the shovel over and over and over. Yeah, it was still pretty graphic for 1966, I think. But heads will roll. Yeah, heads, heads did roll, yeah. yeah. After some digging, they find out that all the graves in the cemetery are empty. All of them? Yeah, all of them. Forbes goes to see Hamilton and accuses him of doing some voodoo. Hamilton throws Forbes out, but Forbes sneaks back inside through an unlocked window. He follows Hamilton through a secret door leading into the tin mines, where all the zombies are hard at work mining tin. That's where he's getting his money from. As Hamilton prepares Sylvia for zombification, Forbes and Thompson close in on the mine. Will they arrive in time? Gotta watch to find Tune out. Tune in and find out. All right, well, it's a little slow-paced, but it moves along without ever getting really getting boring. I enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. There's not all the usual gore involved in the zombie films that are more modern. Yeah, these weren't the kind of brain-eating zombies. Yeah. They were... Dead slaves. Well, like the, the, the Haitian, yeah. Yeah. Raise the dead and use them as slaves kind of zombie. Yeah, yeah. this is more of an old-school zombies from voodoo kind of movie, not the modern crop of plague-based zombies. Mm-hmm. Even no. though the title says Plague of the Zombies, it's not really a disease that's causing it. Well, they got at least 12 of them died. I guess that could be a little plague in a little village. Yeah, I, I guess by definition of a plague, yeah. But it's not a disease. It's, no. a, guy, it's a guy doing it. A, yeah. A Haitian. Modern zombies are all Haitian, plagues or comets or Haitian something priest. like that. Yeah. yeah, this one really is just old, old style voodoo. Mm-hmm. The acting is good, the sets are interesting, and the plot is pretty unusual. All this for a zombie workforce in a dangerous mine. You should mm. just kidnap parolees like the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a great idea, though, from a management standpoint. Nobody asked for a pay raise. Although one thing I noticed with that, he's you know the the mine is producing tin, which he's selling and making money on, and nobody see it. That tin has to go in and out of town. Somewhere, gotta, yeah. the, the shipments of tin have to go out. People have to buy it. People have to you know there's and there's no sign of that anywhere you know no no nothing as far as i have no idea how much tin a tin mine makes with 13 dead people doing the mining they might not come up with huge quantities more than enough to keep him well yeah it was enough yeah well they can work 24 hours a day too no sick days no no vacations yeah yeah. Yeah. not even a lot of breaks yeah well kevin pointed out toward the end that so many hammer films end with the building burning down yeah how often is that a trope in these in hammer films it's an easy way to wrap up loose ends Mm -hmm. yeah the the room goes up in flames (laughs) what's worse than zombies flaming Flaming zombies zombies. Yeah, it, it was yeah, worth it. Overall, a thumbs up, yeah. Yeah, I definitely like Plague of the Zombies better than the Island of Doom Men. Yeah, yeah, yeah pretty much. All right, did you see a short this week? Yeah, I saw a Glass Cabin. A new one. A 2020. Glass Cabin, yes. Mm-hmm. Written and directed by yeah. Ken Turady. Stars Ravel Carpenter, Dave, Davith Mar Stefansson, and Jabari Amir Jones. Well, his real name is David, but in the in the thing, he's David. 
it, yeah, it's 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 strangely pronounced. It's like Norwegian or Swedish or something. It, it probably the way he said it is probably right. But oh, that's it's what still the, spelled. David. Yeah, it is spelled David. Oh, okay, David. Okay. Yeah, and it's fourteen minutes thirty seconds. YouTube link in the show notes, so you can watch this on YouTube for free right now. Did mm-hmm. you fifteen minutes? Mm-hmm. Did you like it? No, not really. I'm a little mixed on it. I mean, it was well made, but it wasn't really horror and wasn't really entertaining. And I didn't, yeah. I thought it's, it was entertaining. It's beautiful, beautiful, <clears throat> beautiful location and mm-hmm. cabin and and good actors and. No, didn't, the, it didn't do anything. The for plot me. was a little it, weak. It, Things were not explained terribly well. Yeah, kind of. At the end, I said, "That's all. That's it." Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, a man I'm walks at, toward a cabin yeah. that is surrounded by glass walls. You've seen him. It's a roof, and the whole thing is just glass all the way around. Mm-hmm. He appears to be acting like a burglar. The renter of the house, Scarlet, is at the gym playing tennis. She's there for some kind of tennis conference or something. She eventually arrives at the house, dragging her suitcase behind her. The man knocks on the window and claims he's here to give her the Wi-Fi password and show her around the house. He points out the phone, uses the bathroom, and then leaves. Yeah, it's not much of a show you how the yeah, house works. Yeah, he, he was there for 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. And then he walks down the long driveway in the snow. Scarlett soon learns that she has no cell phone service at the house. Hmm. So she goes to play tennis again the next day. And after she returns home to rest, a car pulls up and just sits there. Hmm, that's a strange one. Why would you do that? Hmm. The next day, the snow starts piling up, and Scarlet still can't use her phone. She starts getting creeped out. David returns in his car, and Scarlet notices the strange car this time. The power goes out. There's a knock at the door, and David says the roads are closed, and he needs to spend the night. Where is this going? Hmm. Nowhere good. Okay, spoiler time. Well, it's not really clear where this is going until the end. Scarlet seems afraid for several scenes prior to the ending, but she doesn't actually see David until the last scene, so it's not quite clear why she was upset. Just general paranoia about being alone in the exposed cabin, I have to assume. Yeah, I guess. And David is a weird character, not unlike a lot of people you probably know in real life. He's very socially awkward. Mm -hmm. And Scarlet's not unusual either, which is kind of what makes it effective. They're both somewhat normal people in a weird situation. Mm -hmm. And I have a theory, because you said you didn't really know what happened at the end. Okay, what do you think happened? I think she met David at the beginning when he came in and pointed out the phone and was awkward. Yeah. And the rest of it was all her imagination until the end. The power went out and he came to see how she was doing and she killed him. Okay, I'll buy that. And the rest of it was just her own paranoia. She was a mad... Mm -hmm. He was a creepy, weird guy in her mind and she Mm -hmm. just kept picturing him outside all those other times. Uh Uh-huh. There was no interactions until the end. That uh, That seems like a good theory, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But it's totally a theory. It's not spelled out. It's not really clear. It's not one of those things I'm going to spend a lot of time thinking about tonight. It, It's kind of a weak ending. Yeah. Yeah. It, it didn't work for me. Yeah. No, that, Sp- wouldn't, that wouldn't have been. Speaking of weak, <clears throat> what was our next film? The Amityville Murders from 2018. Yeah. In uh, based on true events. Well, this one more than the others. Which really was based on true events. The The Amityville House really did. This was a, a story documented in the news. That, yeah. You know, this guy did kill his family, for real, in the house. The big plot points yeah. in this film were true. What were from a true story. Mm-hmm. The causes behind it, well, that's up to you. Mm-hmm. Whether it's supernatural forces that drove him to it, or if he was just a messed up guy that... You know, did it. It's up to you to decide. Yeah. The, guess which way this movie plays. <laughs> totally supernatural, according to the movie. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. Directed by Daniel Ferens, written by him also, stars John Robinson, Chelsea Ricketts, and Paul Ben Victor. Hour and 37 minutes, link in the usual place. So overall, did you like it? Overall, probably, yeah. I give it a six. A si- I was six. just going to say a six. I, I liked it more than disliked it. Yes. Yeah. But only mildly. Yeah. It's not terribly... <laughs> nothing with the name Amityville is, is original anymore. 
And this definitely seems like they were digging in the bottom of the well for something new. They were scraping. Yeah, yeah. they were. Yeah. Well, we begin with a 911 call about a bunch of people in a house who have been shot dead. Credits roll, and of course it says based on true events. Mm-hmm. Which it was. Well, we pop back three yeah. weeks in time, and it's 1974. Ronald, Butch's father, is a total jerk, and his grandfather gives him a brand new car. It's him. It's, it's his and his sister's, their twins, birthdays, mm-hmm. and a bunch of kids are there for the party. They follow the daughter into the red room in the basement, mm-hmm. which has stuff stored in it. It's a nice-looking little storage room that you got to crawl in through a little tunnel. It's the kind of place little kids would love to play. I remember seeing, a, um, at some point, a, a debunking sort of show about the Amityville. Mm-hmm. The red room is used in this one, and it's used in the original Amityville. How it was, you know, this supernatural portal, and you know, and and the one of the people that was currently living there and said, "Yep, look, it's a red room. Look, it's brick. It's yep, it's red. <laughs> it's a basement room under the stairs. Yep, it's a red room. It was just plain <laughs> brick. It wasn't even painted red. It was red. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. But yeah." It's a red room. <laughs> yeah. There's no port- you know. No portals here. Well, at least there wasn't when she was showing us. Yeah. Okay, well, the daughter yeah. tells him yeah. a story about how the area used to be known as a portal, where the living could commune with the dead. They start chanting and watch a penny slide across a plate. The light bulb explodes, and we see the big Ronnie doesn't like his son and abuses him at every opportunity. He's a jerk. Mm-hmm. Not long after the party, at least portrayed in this movie, yes. Yeah, don't know if he really was. Um, they, you know, that's the thing with these kind of movies; they can take license with. Yeah, he might that, have been a really nice guy, thing. for all we know. Well, yeah, we don't know. Yeah. And not long after the party, strange things start to occur in the house. On searching her twenty-three-year-old son's room, his mother finds needles, drugs, and a notebook full of creepy images. Butch starts hearing voices in his room coming from the walls. When the family goes out for Halloween, leaving Bush behind, someone ransacks the house. Someone. Someone or something. Big Ronnie immediately blames Butch. Sister Dawn mentions that she and Butch used to talk to them when they were little, but Butch thinks he's been hearing them again. Hmm. This naturally gives rise to another satanic ritual, which only makes things worse. Or was he just taking too many drugs? Or was he just taking too many drugs? Because he was definitely taking the drugs. Yeah, yeah, he was. Well, weird things start happening at 3.15 a.m. every night. Meanwhile, Big Ronnie has some mafia troubles, and it could be that they're sending people to terrorize them. Unsurprisingly, things escalate, and it appears that Butch is going insane. Or Hmm. is it all real? Hmm. Things continue until Butch kills everyone in their sleep, and then we close on footage of Butch's arrest and conviction of murder. The end. And it surprised me they showed uh, stills of the real The real aftermath. crime scene, yeah. The real crime scenes, the dead bodies laying there bloodied and dead in, mm-hmm. in bed. It surprised me at the, at the end they showed the real you. Mm-hmm. Well, it's been like 40 years. Yeah, but still, it's, it's a little too real. <laughs> <laughs> and it's well acted and seems to focus heavily on the abuse and the terror of living in an abusive situation, especially when you're high on drugs in the 70s. Mm-hmm. But it's really very slow moving. Kind of, yeah. So yeah, Butch really did kill his entire family, and how he did it still remains a little bit of a mystery because they're all face down like they were asleep. Yeah, and, and it used <clears throat> a, a powerful... Shotgun. After the first shot, they should have all woken up. It was a stormy night, but still, none of them woke up, apparently. Yeah. Um, It's kind of weird. But other than that single fact, the rest Mm -hmm. of the film is completely fictionalized and made up. And a lot of this is simply made-up melodrama, and none of it is at all scary. Not really. Not that much. Well, and part of it is you know how it's going to end. And at the very last scene, they get the money out of the house, and they give it to the father-in-law, because I guess he's in the mob, too. And why do we care? Just something to do, something to do, something to fill out an hour and forty. The mob minutes money was kind of was a point of tension. Could have been a co- you know, could have been really what was you know. The, the mob was behind of, it all. Maybe, yeah. I, I think it was left as a question, as a possibility. The, money, the father was stealing the money, and the mob killed them all, and made it look like the crazy high son did it. Possibly, that's the, yeah. It, it There's of, a new theory. See, it kind of makes you wonder. Now it's time for the Amityville Conspiracy from 2021. There you go. 
Mm -hmm. Credit me with that plot. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. And then we saw a movie that no one's heard of, I think. A 14-year-old movie that no one's heard of. I had heard of it, and now everybody needs to know about it. It's called Population 436, and I thought it was I thought it was good. From 2006, directed by Michelle McLaren, written by Michael Kingston, stars David Ames, Lee Enns, and Susan Kelso. Except that's the order of appearance. It's really, what's that guy's name? Uh, uh, Jeremy Sisko. Sisto. Sisto. Sisto is the main guy. Yeah, I don't... And Fred Durst is a heavily supporting role. Yeah. Um, Lynn Bisgett, lead singer, is also an actor. Before my time. See, and maybe people didn't know that, too. Yeah. Mm. Hour and 32 minutes. All right. Oh, right there on the cover. Jeremy yeah. Sisto and Fred Durst. There yeah. you go. IMDb, IMDb doesn't list them that way. It doesn't list yeah. them. But the, the movie up. poster does. So anyway, welcome to Rockwell Falls, eh? Yeah. Population 436. They have a permanently printed sign that says that. Population 436. You can <laughs> it's stay rele- the night. It's relevant. But you can never leave. <laughs> All right, well, we begin with the scene of a woman giving birth, alternating with a high-speed police chase. The cars are leaving Rockwell Falls, population 436. The truck rolls off the road and explodes, just as the new baby is born back in town. Credits roll. Heck of a timing, huh? Yeah. Heck of a coincidence. Yeah, it's not really all that much coincidental with the way the film is edited. Yeah, yeah. Steve Cady gets lost on the way, and no one will give him directions to Rockwell Falls. That's Jeremy Sisto. Yeah, eventually he arrives and ends up with two flat tires. The police are hesitant to help him until he mentions he's with the U.S. Census Bureau and he's there to look into some discrepancies. He talks to the mayor and sheriff and they're very accommodating. Katie expects his business there will only take a day or two. Mm -hmm. Once he interviews the locals. But then once he's there, they really welcome him to town. It's a very nice place. It's very beautiful. Very friendly. Yeah. Yeah, Idyllic. Well, one of the farmer's wives gets really sick and the doctor states that this is no accident. The town has a town meeting that evening, and the mayor states that they found a place for Katie to stay, until we find something more permanent. Mm -hmm. Oh, and he also reminds everyone, if you haven't already done so, remember to stop your clocks. And anytime they show, there's a, it's even mentioned in the trivia, anytime they show a clock in the town, it's stopped at 436. 436. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Except his... his okay, mine says 440, <laughs> but we're a little over. We're behind schedule. Well, by the, <laughs> by the next morning, everyone in town knows Katie's name, and they all seem very welcoming. People keep asking if he's married or has a family. At one and point... He's, he's there doing his census stuff. Yeah. Getting, a, getting, a, getting the town records and... So he count, meets a lot of people. Counting an interview, and apparently nobody... Apparently everybody ignored their census forms, <laughs> so they sent an agent there to... <laughs> to do it in person. <laughs> so fill out your census forms. <laughs> or they will come for you. Yeah. <laughs> they will come to town and count you. <laughs> well, the man with the sick wife pulls a gun on Katie and mentions the prophecy, but the deputy intervenes. The deputy is uh, Fred Durst. The deputy mentions that there's never been a murder in Rockwell Falls. And hardly any crime. Yeah. Yeah. Katie goes to see Dr. Griever, the town doctor. The doctor's medical license looks like it's from 1948. Turns out it's his father's medical license. This guy never went to medical school. Yeah, and it's explained that uh, they don't—they they don't really go to medical school. They just pass it on through the family, all the knowledge, and yeah, and, and that's fine for the town. We're good. Yeah, they're fine with We're that. We're good yeah. with that. Yeah. <laughs> Katie's not so thrilled. Yeah, he's saying uh, that's not legal, and the police are saying, "Well, we're the law in this town. You it's can't good. go away we to say, medical school." We say it's legal, so yeah, what are you going to do? <laughs> So there's this girl named Amanda being held prisoner in the upstairs window at the doctor's office. The sheriff says the girl has paranoid schizophrenia and that the doctor's family have been treating the town for over a hundred years. He overhears the kids at school doing a weird chant. That night, Katie starts having nightmares. We then get a research montage as Katie reads a book on numerology, checking out what he overheard at the grade school. And one of the things he finds out, too, in the process is that the population has been 436. Consistently. For a, for a long time, the consistent, the town records show. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not long after, he starts hearing about the fever that leaves some people permanently changed. 
Hmm. Amanda explains that people are watching Katie and that if he tries to leave, he'll come down with the, with the fever as well. The father, her father was the man in the pre-credits, pre-credit sequence. Yeah, the one that got blown up trying to leave town. Yeah. Well, the sheriff explains that no one ever leaves Rockwell because God doesn't allow it. And then they ask, how's Katie feeling? Yeah. Has he got a temperature? Yeah, how are you doing, Katie? Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a very suspenseful film. You know something is wrong from the very beginning, but you don't know what or why or how the things are the way they are. Still, through most of the film, the town looks like an idyllic place to live. There doesn't seem to be any real reason to leave. It takes a little over an hour before things start really going off the rails. And then you find out, yeah, things. Yeah. Yeah. And Kind of reminded me of we're Midsummer. Not gonna spoil it. not going to spoil it more than that. A little bit. A little bit. Yeah. 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 Hints of that. Yeah. yeah some of that. Yeah. And we're not going to spoil it any more than that. Yeah. It was good. I, yeah. I enjoyed the second viewing as well. I liked it yeah. too. Yeah. It, was, it was fine. Mm-hmm. I'd give it a seven. I'd give it an eight and a half. Eight, eight, eight and a half. Yeah. All right. It's up there. It's yeah. up there, yeah. yeah. And that's our show. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Stop in during the week at our website, horrorguys.com, for news and horror updates, to comment on this podcast, or to contact us. Get ready for next week. We'll be watching some more classics. Sounds like a good week. Mm-hmm. See you next week. I'm Brian. I'm Kevin. See ya. See ya.